Well, now, now that the recording's on, what, what class are you talking about? Oh, for God. <laughs> <laughs> He's got guts, I'll give you that. I was, uh, I don't know why. I don't know why I tell this story, but I was in, uh, I was in undergrad, and we had a course on construction estimating. It's about uh, if you have a, a given project, how you do, uh, how you come up with how much it's going to cost at the end of the day, material, labor, all that stuff. What's that? You'd be surprised between between material estimates, but labor rates, understanding insurance, all that stuff. You know. It's funny you say that because I, I don't. It probably won't help you now, but um, I'm teaching co-op next semester, and um, I'm, I'm co-teaching it with uh, Tanner Drown, our co-op coordinator. And I told him I said we should have a lecture, and just bring in somebody from HR to talk about insurance and and. Ooh. What it's, it's funny you say that because I said we're we're going to do a two-part lecture. I, I wasn't going to talk about taxes, but. Um, I was thinking we should bring somebody to talk about investments. Will you put yeah. those videos up on YouTube? Yeah. If they're fine with recording, then yes. Because um, I can tell you, so the honest truth of it is, so I, I was, you know, 27 years old. I just finished my PhD. I come to Marshall, and they say, okay, um, within the first couple weeks, you need to pick your health insurance package. And they showed me this. Uh, what the heck is this? You know, so. I think that there's some reality to that, understanding that, understanding like different ways you can finance a house, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that stuff's important, you know, um, and, and I think it could be beneficial. All right. Um, I know I said I'd get the projects graded today. I really tried, but I had some fires I had to put out uh, these past couple days. I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to get uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the projects graded. But given that our final was on Monday, I kind of got to knock it out. So, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, one thing I did want to mention, uh, so if you submitted your screenshot for your course eval, at, at least before like 9.30 this morning, I have already given you your 10 bonus points. If you look on Blackboard, they're already awarded. Um, but a couple things, number one, two of you, so what I can see on the background for me is all I know is how many of you did it. So I know that there's two people in the class that did the survey but haven't uploaded the screenshots. It's free points you're leaving on the table. So if you did the survey, upload the proof, and I'll give you 10 bonus points. Like, again, you could say I'm the worst professor ever. Um, you know, as I told Statics, or maybe you, I can't remember, you could say that my math jokes are horrible and I need to derive some new ones. But, um, you know, that, see, yeah. That, yeah. that joke was just a, another in a long series of, of more bad math jokes. Series. They are, they are. They're getting bad. You hit your limit with them. All right. <laughs> what is it, the, the chemistry jokes? Like, this class is boron. Oh. Well, I guess you're just going to have to sulfur through it. I love my job. Okay, so homework 9.1 was due today. Homework 9.2 is the one that I'm assigning today. It's due Friday, but right at, because our final is on Monday, so I don't have a lot of time to get that graded, get the solution to you, et cetera. So homework 9.2 is due at 10, and I'm not accepting any late submissions because right at 10 a.m., the solution is uh, going to be available. So get that done. Fortunately, it's a pretty easy assignment. Um, the bonus homework, don't forget that. I, I, the survey closes. Uh, Friday, but I'll let the screenshot uh, upload continue until Monday. Um, but yeah, if you haven't done your survey, do so, free points. Okay, tributary area. Now, this is something that you already have a bit of experience with because of the project, but what we need to do is we need to talk about how to take the concept of tributary area and expand it 
to, and I, I don't want to use the term real life scenarios because I truly believe that while the project was a bit simplistic from a design standpoint, um, the, the, dist, the, the, the core principles that we used in that project were dead on what you would do in real life. Um, what, uh, what I want to do is take the concept of tributary area and expand it to maybe different types of systems, um, beams and frames and stuff like how would you design that beam or this column or you know how would you distribute dead load in a bridge and so on and so forth. So I, I think you'll kind of understand that a little bit today. Um, how do we take uh, an element in a, a building, a beam and column, and resolve it into what we've been doing all semester? I mean, this is a, 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 a full-blown three-dimensional building, and I want to turn it into a line with the triangle and the circle at the end with the point loads on it that I can come up with uh, shears and moments that I can ultimately design that element with. Um, so the first question that I want to help address, and I talked about this a little bit during the project, is where the heck do the loads come from, right? The, the loads just seem to have miracled themselves onto uh, all of our problems that we've been doing this semester. I give you a beam and I say this beam is subjected to three kips per foot. Where the heck did the three kips per foot come from? Where did that 20 kip concentrated load or that 600 foot kip moment come from? Did they just, oh, that's just what we're doing. Well, that's not how it works in the real world. Nobody's going to tell you when you're designing a building that the beam is experiencing a 20 kip concentrated load or something like that. You're going to have to resolve that based on the system that you're assessing. So the first thing I want to talk about is where structural loads come from. Now, I would argue or I would state that, that um, for conventional structural analysis or structural engineering projects, we have five essentially types of loads that we need to consider, five. Three of them act in the direction of gravity. Okay, The three that act in the direction of gravity are dead loads, live loads, and snow. Okay, um, And you could refine that and say, well, what about ice or rain or, you know, you could, and, and there are instances in the um, uh, building spec where there is a differentiation between the occupancy live load and construction live loads, like the live load on the roof versus the live load on the floors and so on and so forth. And there are uh, uh, differentiations between those, those categories. But really, the, the three main classes of gravity-induced uh, effects are dead load being the self-weight, live load being what the occupancy, what the building's being used for, and snow, um, you know, your sort of environmental gravity load. And then the two lateral loads that we deal with are wind and earthquakes. Those are the, those are the two lateral events. And every other uh, uh, sort of load event can sort of be grouped more often than not into one of those uh, categories. So where do these loads come from? They typically come from one of two places, either codes and specifications. So if you're designing a bridge, the bridge spec will tell you, you know, here is the lane load. Remember when we did ASHO? We said that the ASHTO lane load was 640 pounds per foot. If you remember that, that, that is the lane load uh, that represents vehicular traffic in the United States. And so that's what we use. Um, you can go to documents like ASC 7, and it'll tell you what are some common floor dead loads, what are some live loads for roofs, for classrooms, for hotels, for office buildings, et cetera. So whatever you're designing, you can map that to the appropriate live load for whatever element you're looking at in your structure. The other place that, that uh, structural loading comes from is the client. If you're designing, uh, so for example, I have a, a former student of mine, uh, that she's a practicing structural engineer in the DC area, and she's done a lot of really intricate design work, and so uh, she was telling me about a, uh, a project where she was designing a cold storage uh, facility, and you know, the live load came from the client. They're like, I need a floor that can hold up this much, because that's you know, that's what the client needed. Um, typically, clients are only going to spec out load estimations or load demands when your project is sort of technical in nature. Like if Geico comes to you and says, I need a new corporate headquarters, Geico doesn't care if the building's made out of steel or concrete or popsicle sticks. They just want an office building, you know? So they're not going to come to you and say, I need this building to hold up 50 PSF. They don't, they don't know. That's not their world, right? But if it's a... I don't know if, 
if you're designing like a factory or something or some sort of industrial facility, they might tell you, hey, I need this floor system to hold up this load. So that's typically where your loads come from. They either come from codes and specifications or they come from the client. And it just depends on the project. Um, but what we need to do is take those loads and, uh, and force effects that we need to apply to a given structure and we need to distribute them to associated beams, columns, trusses, connections, etc., in such a way that, uh, that we can resolve the problem into something that we can analyze and ultimately design. And that's where the concept of tributary area comes into play. Now the definition of tributary area is essentially the area that a given member is responsible for. Uh, and so, for example, if I, the, the common uh, 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 example that I use when I'm in a classroom is I look at these two columns right here. So here's a column and here's a column. And so this column has got to hold up some of the building from falling uh, on our heads. And so I propose that this column is responsible for all of the load halfway over to this column right here. So the tributary area for this column might be, you know, everything halfway over to here, halfway over to here, because we got one here, and then maybe halfway over to the next column on this side. And that's the area that that particular column is responsible for. And so if, let's say there's a pressure load on the floor, pressure times area will tell me the force that that column needs to withstand. And that is, in a nutshell, how tributary area works. And we can use this concept to perform what's called a load takedown on a structure. So a load takedown is I have a building, let's say it's subjected to 40 PSF, I take that and, and determine what's the shear and bending moment on this beam, what's the reaction on this girder, what's the axial load on this column. And so you take that, that load and distribute it to all of the associated elements because once I get a, let's say, maximum shear and bending moment on a given beam, I can then start to design that beam and then I can start to build it and then I get money uh, as an engineer for doing my job. So, make sense? Okay, so where does the concept of tributary area get applied? So here's an example, and this is super basic, but I think it kind of uh, illustrates the point. So I have a generic floor pattern, um, and I've got, uh, so I want you to sort of understand what's going on in this picture right here. So what this picture is looking at is us in the helicopter looking down at the floor plan. So these squares right here are the columns sticking up out of the ground, right? So they're, they're in the ground looking up, so all we see is sort of like the little square where the columns are. Um, in the world of structural engineering, the term beam and the term girder get interchanged a lot. And there's a third term that you'll hear a lot, beams girders and stringers. You tend to hear those three terms get interchanged quite a bit. There's another term that kind of gets thrown around and that's joists. Joists, uh, that, that term doesn't get confused a lot because joists have a, a very particular place in structural engineering land. For example, how many of you have ever been to a store, I think it's called Walmart. Have you heard of Walmart? Have you been to a Walmart? You, Alejandro has been to Walmart. Uh, <laughs> but if you go to Walmart and you look up, um, what do you see? Okay, so first off, when you're in the Walmart, you see the column, right, that, that's, uh, that's right in, in front of the hamburger helper, and it's like, come on, I, why would you put a column there? It's because you don't want the roof to fall down and kill somebody. Uh, and then you've got, if look up, right, and you'll see these sort of, um, they look like little mini trusses, like they're kind of like these, these uh, they have like a flat bar on the top and bottom and these sort of little truss looking things. Those are called open web joists. And they are beams. They are acting as flexural elements to, uh, to withstand the load. But like I'll go ahead and tell you, in steel design, we actually never really talk about them because the design of them is so simple. Do the analysis, look it up in a catalog, go home and, ha and, and uh, play video games because that's all there is to it. They're very simple. Um, but uh, beams, columns, and girders, or sorry, beams, or beams, girders, and, and, and stringers, those terms get interchanged a bit. The way that I like to differentiate them is I think that the, uh, the way I like to say it is the beam frames into the girder, right? So the beams are the little elements and the girders are the big ones. So like here's a beam and it connects here and here into the girder. Does that make sense? So when we talk about tributary area, 
Um, again, the concept of tributary area is that it's defined as halfway over to the next adjacent element. So if I'm looking at, let's say, I don't know, this, oh, I don't want notifications. Um, go, there we go. What? I don't want notifications. Okay. I want to go back a slide. I want you to stay there. So if I'm looking at, let's say, this beam right here, I propose that the tributary area is halfway over to the next adjacent beams, right? And so if I were to say that this is the tributary width and this is the length, then the tributary area is WT times the length, right? Now, the way that we can handle this from an analysis standpoint is we say, okay, let's say this beam is subjected to 50 pounds per square foot and the tributary width is 10 feet. Well, 50 times 10 is 500, and we can turn that into a beam with a 500 pound per foot distributed load. And what do you think a structural engineer is going to do when they have a problem that looks like this? No. What they're going to do is they're going to break out the homework 9.1 that they did for Dr. Michelson back in college, and they're going to go, oh, I remember, what was that formula for the maximum moment uh, for a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load? That's the number right there, WL squared over 8. Everybody did the homework, right? The shear would be the WL over 2, yes. But I would say, okay, now I don't need to break out the shear and moment diagram. I could just go to my analysis aid and say, boom, maximum shear is WL over 2, maximum moment is WL squared over 8, pick a beam. You see what I'm, see what I'm getting at, right? See how like all the skills that we, that we develop to start to turn into real life? Now, that's the beams. If I'm looking at, let's say, this girder, this girder, there's a couple of ways of analyzing it. Um, the first is I could just treat it as a distributed load. I could say halfway over to the next adjacent girder, halfway over to the next adjacent girder. That's one way of handling it. Another way of handling it is to take a look at this beam. Here's the beam. That beam has a reaction here and here, right? Those reactions don't just vanish. They have to go somewhere. It's a hip bone connected to the leg bone type of situation. The beam reactions go to the girders. The girder reactions go to the columns. The column reactions go to the ground, right? So what I can do is look at this girder and say there's one, two, three, four points where the beams frame in. I can treat the girder like this, right? And how much are each of these point loads if I'm looking at, let's say, this girder? How many reactions do each of these point loads represent? Hold on. If I'm looking at this point, how many beams frame in? One, two. So this P is 2R. Does that make sense? 2R of that. Does, does that make sense? Let me give you a, a little bit of a real world example so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. You may recognize where this picture is taken. This is the 3rd Avenue parking garage right down the road, okay? So um, in the 3rd uh, uh, Avenue parking garage, they're using uh, pre-top double T's. Uh, this is a precast reinforced concrete element uh, to act as the main uh, driving surface support system. And then it's a, a similar system where the beams frame into the girders, the girders frame into the columns, columns frame into the ground. And so, for example, if I was looking at one of these stems, Let's say I'm looking at this one right here. I propose that the tributary area for that is maybe something like that. That this area right here is what that particular stem is responsible for before the next one takes over, right? And then the reaction from this beam is going to be seen as a point load on this girder. So there's a point load here, 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 point load here. And so what? Six point loads 
that go into the columns. Does that make sense? Is that, again, it's sort of a hip bone connected to the leg bone thing. Now, unlike the last example I talked about, the last example there were two reactions because that was an interior girder. This is an exterior girder on the edge of the building, so it's only going to see one reaction from each end because there's not a beam out here hanging over 3rd Avenue. Does that make sense? Okay. I should just carry this around with me. It's a remote. That's the whole point. All right. I have a floor system like this. Okay, one of the things I did sort of um, gloss over, how many of you have ever seen like floor plans, like architectural floor plans for a building? You should recognize this sort of grid pattern where on one axis the columns are labeled with letters and on one axis they're labeled with numbers. That's very common. You'll see like this is grid A4 and so on and so forth. Um, another bit of terminology, this space right here, this sort of like block of beams and columns that exist between two grid references is called a bay, right? So a lot of times you'll hear structural engineers would say this building has 50 foot by 30 foot bays, B-A-Y-S, okay? So if you ever hear that term, that's, that's what that means. Now, I have a floor system subjected to 20 pounds per square foot. That is not a lot of force, okay? To put it in perspective, what is 20 divided by 144? What, like, point two? Okay, so point one four PSI. How much load does your car put on the ground? What, in terms of pressure, maybe 32 PSI, 36 PSI? That's how much, I mean... Did you ever know that, that the pressure that you put in your tire, that's how much pressure is being put on the ground? Statics, I know, it's crazy. That's the truth, yeah, whatever your tire pressure is. But it turns, we're like 47 right now. 47? It's going down, it's about to go down. So for mine, it's like I'll inflate it, then three miles, four miles, the tire pressure monitoring system turns on. You know, I think it's I think those systems are just so sensitive. You know, like your if your pressure is within point oh two psi, it's like oh it's off, you gotta go fix it. You know. I had a, um, uh, when I was in grad school, I had a Hyundai, and um, there was, uh, so I had a, a, a tire that needed, or no, it wasn't a tire, it was the, the what happened was the valve, the tire pressure valve uh, needed to be replaced, and they said, so if you look, there's there's the valve, and then there's the little sensor that goes with it, and they said, so you can replace that, and it's like 80 bucks, or you could just put like a regular valve in it, and it's like 20 bucks, I said. Sign me up for that regular valve. <laughs> so I, my tire pressure monitoring system light on was just constantly on. But that was my fault. I, it's like the one time it's like the light's on and it's fine. And I know it's fine because I messed it up. So, Okay. But my point is 20 pounds per square foot is not a lot of load. Um, and I want you to see how that can generate just a monumental amount of force uh, in a building because the building's really big. So we're going to determine um, some specific... Uh, I guess what I would say is um, this card. Uh, some specific analysis results for this building. What we're going to do is we're going to say, um, here's the building. Go away. And we're going to say, um, determine the distributed load on a typical interior beam. Determine the concentrated loads on a typical girder. Determine the axial load on a typical column. And you're going to see how the loads get crazy real quick, okay? So let's take, um, let's start off with a typical beam, okay? And I, I got a few floor plans here because we're going to be repeating some calculations. 
so if I pick this beam right here, what is the tributary area for that floor beam? It's halfway over here and halfway over here. What is the tributary width for that beam? Say it again. 10 feet, because it's 5 feet on each side. So this would be a reasonable representation of the tributary area. Now, here's what we're going to do, okay, in terms of, of distributing this load, okay? Um, for the floor beam, we know that the tributary width is 10 feet, and we know the length of the beam is 30 feet. So what we're going to do is th this is how we're going to assess it. Now, remember, the floor is subjected to a pressure load of 20 pounds per square foot. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at that floor beam. And let's say this is the floor beam that we're looking at right here. We're going to say halfway over to the next floor beam halfway over to the next floor beam. And what we're going to do is say, I want to take this problem and turn it into this. And instead of some pressure load, I want to take that and turn it into just a uniformly distributed load. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to say that if this is 20 PSF and this width is 10 feet, then I propose that this distributed load is 20 PSF times 10 feet. 200 pounds per foot. Does that make sense? The whole beam is going to see, what is it, 200 pounds per foot over 30 feet. So the whole beam is going to see 6,000 pounds. But that 6,000 pounds, I mean, let me ask you this. Do you think that 6,000 pounds is going to act like a single 6,000 pound load right in the middle, or is it going to act like spread out over the length of the beam? And so that's what it's going to do, right? It's going to act like it's spread out over the length of the beam. And if the beam is... 30 foot long, that's 200 pounds per foot. So I propose that we can model this problem like this. And here, is our analysis model. This is us taking a real life structure and turning it into something that we can deal with, that we have the tools to assess, right? We know how to draw shear and moment diagrams for this. We know how to compute support reactions for this, uh, et cetera. We can compute deflections. and and what have you. So you kind of see what we're talking about here? Again, as I told you at the beginning of this week, my goal is to end this course in the realm of reality. This is what I'm talking about, okay? Everybody with me so far? So just on the side, and the problem didn't ask for this, but um, the problem asked for the distributed load on the beam. The distributed load on the beam is 200 pounds per foot. But how would you determine the reactions? How would you determine the shears, the moments? What would you use? I'm asking what would you use from what we talked about in the last lecture? You'd use those analysis aids, right? Why do we need to analyze this structure when we already have the formulas and tools necessary to do analysis of any? simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. Right, of course, you can draw the shear and moment diagram if you want, but why, you know? <clears throat> Make sense? 
What is the reaction for this beam? WL over 2. So let's compute that. So note R beam is what? Three thousand pounds. So think, point one two psi caused enough reaction on the end of that beam to be heavier than some cars. It's surprising. Us structural engineers, we deal with heavy loads, very heavy stuff. So you got to know what you're doing. That's why I take my job very seriously. Quite frankly, I don't want to drive on a bridge and it falls down and I find out, oh God, every one of my students. <laughs> I'm not going to address that. All right, does this make sense? Okay, now um, the second part of the problem asked for the concentrated loads on girder C2, D2. So girder C2, D2 is that one. So I propose that we can model that girder as a simply supported beam. And how many point loads would be on that girder? And before you, let's, let's ignore these ones right here because I'll talk about those here in a bit. Eight total, but four locations, right? So, P, 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 P. And each of those distances are 10 feet long. How much are each of these point loads? 2R, exactly. So, two R beam, 6,000 pounds. Does this make sense? Let me ask you a question. Can you look at this problem and tell me what is the reaction of this girder going to be? <clears throat> like what's the reaction here and here? Two P, right? And what is that? 12,000 pounds? Because look, 6,000, 6,000, 6,000, 6,000 is 24,000, so 12,000 up on each end because it's symmetric. So twelve thousand pounds on the end of each girder from twenty PSF. That's crazy, isn't it? This is not unheard of. This is not unheard of loads in the world of structural engineering. I have a question. Yeah. Why don't you include the loads at the end? The ones at the ends? Yeah. You mean the ones that go here and here? Yeah. That is a great question. If you stay tuned, you're going to like my answer. I'll Just wait. Watch. You stay tuned in the next five minutes. I got 13 minutes. Watch this. The third part of this problem said to look at column B2. So 
This is column B2 right here. Okay? I propose that the tributary area is halfway over to the next adjacent column. So like halfway over to this one, halfway over to that one. So if I were to draw the tributary area for that column, would you agree with that? Okay. Tell me how what how would I compute that? What's the like what is the answer? Like what is the area? It's something times something. What is the width? What is this distance? 50. What's this distance? 30. So 50 times 30 15 square or 1500 square feet. So the load on that column would be 30,000 pounds? Everybody with me on that? He's sitting there going, but that didn't answer my question. Watch this. I'm going to look at this column a little differently. Remind me, what did we compute as R for the beam? What did we get for our beam? What did we get for our girder? The reason that we didn't include the loads on the ends when we looked at the girder is because they don't frame into the girder. They frame directly into the column. If I look at this column right here, how many girders frame into that column? How many beams frame into that column? So could you also say that the load on that column is two beam reactions plus two girder reactions, which is two times 3,000 plus 2 times 12,000. Which is the same as what we got before. My answer to your question is, is that we didn't account for it on the girder because those beams don't frame into the girder. They frame into the columns. And when you look at the columns, you can look at the columns one of two different ways. You can say, I'm just going to take area times pressure and get an answer. Or you can say, I'm going to use the hip bone connected to the leg bone approach. And you will get the same number here as we did up there. That's my answer to the question. <clears throat> Didn't have to wait till next week. I'm being snarky on my last day. Well, not last last day. We have exam review on, on Friday. And then the final on Monday. You thought you were getting out of it there for a second. You're like, what, 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 what? We don't have a final? Yeah, no. Uh, uh. I'll see you on Monday, right? <laughs> Be pretty messed up if I said something. I'm going to look at your exam extra special. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I thought you said you don't look at people's exams. I don't. 
I don't, honestly, it's such a, I mean, by the end of when I get finished grading, it's such a C. I, it's like, somebody asked, like, do you know how I did on the exam? I have no idea how you did on the exam. I know how problem six did, but I don't know how you did. I really don't. Well, you have the at-home game. It's like a, it's like an opposite of that, like Wayne Gretzky quote or something. Like you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take or something. It's like the opposite of that. I can still pass a class and not take the test. I'm just not coming. I need to help. You know the elderly. What was it you said earlier? I did help the yeah. That's why, he's, but but that's not the whole story. So. What? You must enjoy Vegas. Like. <laughs> I said I rounded, but you have to get at 89.5 or higher. I'm like, you're at 89.4. I will say this. For the students that are on that line, I usually really pay attention to it. I'm like, okay, I really need to look at that. So I usually give it another once over. Okay. Any questions? So I've given you, there's a floor plan. It's actually in chapter two of the textbook. And um, I asked you some similar questions about that floor plan. Um, things like, uh, what are the, um, uh, the reactions here, or the maximum bending moment here? I want to be crystal clear. Um, you did homework 9.1, and you got WL squared over 8 and, and stuff like that. I have no problem with you using those analysis aids for this homework. I told you we were ending this class in the realm of reality, and I definitely want to continue to do that. So, I mean, you, I'm, I'm trying to teach you all to be structural engineers, you know, and these are the tools that you use. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit real quick about the final so that you have some, some understanding. Like I said, there's going to be three problems. You know, one's going to be related to influence lines. One's going to be related to, uh, to mass stand. One's going to be related to this stuff we've been talking about uh, this week. So, you know, if you understand what we've been doing for the past few days, you're going to find this is really a uh, really straightforward stuff. And I, and I, as much as like what we've been doing today and Wednesday might be, I don't know, new, I'm not sure that what we've been doing today and Wednesday is all that new. I mean, we've done tributary area before with the project, and the analysis aid stuff was just throwing some symbols into the mix and showing you something that you'll use later. But it's not like we were developing entirely new skills. We've been, we've been doing this all semester. So that's why I really like closing the class with this. All right, any questions? Yes, we are having exam review on Friday. I don't know whether or not my recording software will work on Friday. We'll <laughs> I guess we'll have to take a chance. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody, that's all I got. <laughs>